Hello, listeners. Been wondering how you can help the show? Probably not. But here are five things you can do. One, subscribe. Support the show by clicking the subscription link in the show notes. Two, review on iTunes, on our website, www.afraidofnothingpodcast.com, or on whatever app you listen to. Three, donate. When you go to our website, click the cute coffee cup icon. Or in the show notes, click the subscription link. Four, share. Sharing really is caring. Tell your friends and even your enemies to check out the show. Five, watch. Wait a minute. It's a podcast, not a movie. Actually, it's both. Check the show notes to find out where to watch the documentary. You can also rent it on Prime Video. That's it. Oh, one last thing. Enjoy this episode. Tonight's guest talks to real-life people who think they're possessed. Based on his astute psychiatric evaluations, sometimes they are. Your mother sit here with us. Would you like to leave a message? I see that she cares. She cares. She cares. Get ready to enter the dark side with Dr. Richard Gallagher as we talk about his book, Demonic Foes. In a world where nothing is known, nothing is certain, reality is not real. Wake up! Be afraid of nothing. I'm Bob Heskey. Robert. The host with the ghost. This is my podcast, based on my paranormal documentary, Afraid of Nothing. Each episode, we talk to people who see life and the afterlife through a different lens. Join me. Who is this large man? And what's he doing in our bedroom? As we lift the veil and open our minds to see beyond our eyes lie. This is Afraid of Nothing. Nothing. A board-certified psychiatrist and highly experienced clinician and teacher... Richard Gallagher, MD, is a professor of psychiatry at New York Medical College and a psychoanalyst on the faculty of Columbia University. He earned a bachelor's degree at Princeton University in Classics Phi Beta Kappa. After teaching and playing basketball in France, he came back to the U.S. for medical school and eventually trained as a resident in psychiatry at Yale University. He is the longest standing member of the International Association of Exorcists since the early 1990s, serving for a time as a scientific advisor on its governing board. He has devoted many years to distinguishing the rare cases of overt demonic attacks from the much more common conditions of medical and psychiatric disorders. In this capacity, Dr. Gallagher has undoubtedly seen more cases of possession, many quite harrowing than any other physician in the world. His recent book is Demonic Foes, My 25 Years as a Psychiatrist Investigating Possessions, Diabolic Attacks, and the Paranormal. And it's available on Amazon in hardcover, paperback, and Kindle. The book can also be heard on Audible. Dr. Gallagher lives in Westchester, New York, after serving for many years as the county's psychiatric emergency and crisis director. Dr. Gallagher, welcome to the podcast. Appreciate your time on the 4th of July today. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, you've written a great book called Demonic Foes, My 25 Years as a Psychiatrist Investigating Possessions, Diabolic Attacks, and the Paranormal. I actually listened to it a couple times on Audible. thought it was fantastic. Before we go into your backstory and how you became involved in exorcism and evaluating cases of possession and oppression, do you mind just giving our audience a little bit of the history and background about the field of exorcism? Exorcism is a term that came to be adapted in the Christian orbit, meaning driving out demons. But the idea of exorcism and the idea of possession by spirits 
goes back throughout all recorded history and, you know, presumably before history was written down. So quite clearly all throughout history, pretty much all cultures have believed number one in evil spirits and number two, the vast majority have believed in possession. There was a, uh, a very thorough anthropologist, her name was uh, Erica Bourguignon. She did a study of 374 cultures and she found clear evidence for beliefs in possession in three quarters of them. This is throughout history and in the present era. Of course, the absence of evidence doesn't mean the evidence of absence. I believe that belief in evil spirits has been pretty universal in history. Now, it doesn't mean there haven't been skeptics too, but basically the culture, as our culture, by the way, does largely believe in evil spirits, certainly in America and in the rest of the world, with the possible exception of Europe, where their belief is a little, uh, a little less, let's say. So you have to know the history of the concept in the sense of possession is ubiquitous in history. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not rare, but it's been reported in all these different cultures. What differs, of course, is people's interpretation of what's going on. Now, most cultures in early history, pre-Christian history, pre-biblical history in a way, believe that people could be possessed by different entities. Most prominently, things like dead souls might possess somebody. Or, for instance, the Greeks believed, and most pagan cultures, and of course most of the world was pagan, they believed that gods or goddesses or mischievous spirits uh, of different sorts could possess people. If you remember your high school history, the Oracle of Delphi, you know, what happened there? The, the voice of Apollo would come out of her. She would go into a trance and a different sounding voice, which was clearly using her vocal cords, would come out, would make predictions. And people from all over the uh, Mediterranean world would come to hear this woman because some of those predictions would turn out to be remarkably accurate. That was a type of voluntary possession. And of course, there's also involuntary possessions also throughout all of history. When the ancient uh, Hebrews and then on through the Christians came along, they had a purer view of, you know, the divine and monotheism. And they also began, especially even, even before Christ, they, they began to posit a whole realm of true evil spirit. Although again, there were slightly different views about that. And then in the Christian era, especially after uh, Jesus walked the face of this earth, uh, who was in my, this is just an historical opinion, was by far, he certainly was the most famous, but he was also by far the most effective exorcism in history, exorcist in history. And then the churches developed a certain, you know, whole theology that these were fallen angels. And when they were forced to leave, as happens in a successful exorcism, they pretty much invariably have to acknowledge their true identity and their true name. They admit that they're evil spirits. What's interesting is they admit they're evil spirits after first trying to lie about it. And they may say, I'm, uh, you know, the dead soul of the emperor, or I'm Judas Iscariot or something. I've even had people who are possessed who say, I'm Zeus, or I'm Apollo. So all these false identifications throughout history Evil spirits will still try to lie and fool people into believing that's what they are. But when the churches effectively exercise people, the demon is forced to reveal their true name and their true nature, which is, which is as an evil spirit. Once they have to tell the truth, can they go back to be a pathological liar again? Or in this, in this instance, are they, is, is that what forces them to leave that body? But would they go to another body and, and continue, just try someone weaker? 
Well, you got a couple of different questions there, and and you know, it's not as if anybody completely knows exactly what the strategy, you know, going from one person to another is. That's a more complicated question that you may want to get back to. But the short answer is an exorcist is supposed to stick to the job. In other words, they're supposed to ask questions like the basic questions, like what is your name? When are you going to leave? And why did you, you know, possess this person? All these other extraneous questions are regarded as a little bit foolish to ask. Curiosity is not what the issue here. The priest, for instance, in the Catholic Church, the priest has a task to do, is to get, get rid of this problem. And so they stick to the basic questions. Now, why do they ask those questions? Well, for instance, they want to start to get some control over the spirit because the spirit doesn't really want to reveal itself. As I said before, they'll lie for long periods of time until they're forced to, and, and we believe ultimately they're forced to by God. The deliverance is not by the priest. The deliverance is by God. And of course, Christians regard Jesus as the son of God doing it. When the demon reluctantly is forced to reveal its name, what that represents is a kind of submission. In other words, they're being forced to do something by this human agent that they don't really want to do. And what that indicates is that the hold they have on the possessed individual is loosening. In other words, the, the church, God, the priest, you know, working in tandem is starting to get more obedience more authority over the evil spirit. And that's usually a good sign that eventually that person will be delivered. And, you know, deliverance varies tremendously. So, you know, it could happen in one session, could happen after many, many years, or there are cases where it doesn't happen at all. Is it recorded where the first, ex I mean, the most famous one, as you mentioned, is Jesus Christ. But you know where in recorded history, where the first exorcism was recorded? It, does it go back to Egypt or Samaria or... It goes back to, you know, Sumer. There are records in the Sumerian language that uh, they believed in evil spirits and that they had exorcists. Uh, and then there are many, you know, in, in ancient cultures like Babylonia, Persia, there are clear records that these things have been going on. Some of your most famous cases are in the 80s and 90s, Julia, which we'll get into later. Has there been an uptick the past 10 years or so in the number of people that think they're possessed? The reason I ask is because I think the number of exorcists has increased from like 2005 to maybe a dozen to over 100 nowadays. So has it has there been more well, people coming forward or? That's just in this country because there, there are hundreds and hundreds around the world, at least if we're talking about the Catholic Church. And of course, you know, our Protestant brethren uh, have many exorcists too. The Catholic Church is perhaps a little more organized and I would say rigorous about it, but you know, it doesn't mean that Protestant clergy don't have effective eggs as well. It's a tough question, uh, like a lot of questions in this field, because you know, there are murky elements to this field. There are a lot of people who believe that there are more possessions nowadays, which again is rare. Even so, there are a fair amount of you know, religious experts who do believe that the, that exorcisms, albeit rare, are rising in number. Now, why is that? Well, the idea is that as, as people, at least in the Western world, including in America, are moving away from traditional religion, they're turning to all alternative kind of spiritualities, some of which are, you know, at least quasi-diabolic in some ways, at least occultic, and that people open a door. Other people would argue that that might be a factor and there might be a rise in possessions. But what there seems to be clearly is more awareness of this whole subject. Of course, that implies that more people might think they're possessed, even if they're not. And I think that that definitely has, has occurred. So, you know, the church in its, in its wisdom has decided, look, more people who are requesting at least a consultation with an exorcist, whether the exorcism is authorized or not, is, is another question. 
but that we ought to respond to the wishes of the people. The unfortunate thing is that it is true. There are more exorcisms, possibly more possessions, at least somewhat, in dealing with these rare phenomena to begin with. But there are certainly more people who request it, and therefore the church has tried to respond to that. You're a man who likes history and science. I was originally going to talk about science at the end, but I'm wondering if this is a good segue. You've given us the background of exorcisms that go way far back and very faith-based on how to deal with that. When did science become involved with it? Uh, Was it more in the diagnosis? Is it more mental illness and looking at it in the evaluation aspect, or does science play a different role? Well, you're talking to a, you know, full professor, so I'm going to give you somewhat of an academic response. Science as we understand it today, and it's made great, great advances, say, in engineering, space exploration, medicine. So I'm a big believer in modern science. That science is essentially based on a set of principles, which we usually call, philosophers of science will call methodological naturalism. Now, what they mean by that is we advance in science by sticking to certain methods and without assuming, say, there's something supernatural. And we've made a lot of advances by in the last centuries, you know, since we've adopted those principles. Now, the term originally, scientia, science, it's a Latin word, and it's translation of a Greek word, episteme, which is where you get the word epistemology. That was a broader definition. What that meant was knowledge, so that all types of what was thought to be legitimate knowledge Uh, Obviously, there can be disputes about that, but what was thought to be knowledge was regarded as science. And then it got narrowed down to more methods. The evidence base for possessions, which we talked about, is actually throughout history and much more massive than people think historically. The evidence for possessions is historical. Now, history, is that a type of science? Well, it's not anti-scientific, but it's a different way of looking at the question. In in my opinion, it's a type of knowledge, if you're really familiar with the data and the historical evidence. But it's not quite, you know, you can't do experiments on evil spirits. They're spirits. So you're not going to be able to do experiments on non-material realities, which is what they are. So you're not going to be able to get x-rays. People say, well, how about at least audio tapes and videotape? Dr. Gallagher, you've reported some cases that have levitated. Why don't you have videotapes of that? It's a naive request by the skeptical people because you're dealing not only with a non-material entity, you're dealing with an entity that has its own will and its own intelligence and its own strategy. In fact, I think that most evil spirits, just as much most angels, I believe in angels too, these creatures are generally more intelligent than, than we are. And they have their own ways of operating. They're not just going to perform for a camera. They're very aware of what's going on. And they know whether they're being videotaped. You think after semi trying to hide themselves for years, even though they do reveal themselves at other time, depending on their nefarious purposes, you think that they're all of a sudden going to perform for the camera? There are people who have attempted to videotape them and have sort of murky evidence. They're uh, recording somebody who's just somewhat psychotic or something. So people have tried to do it, but they haven't been able to get the best evidence on videotape because evil spirits will not allow that. Now, the Catholic Church as well, at least the Catholic Church, forbids people to videotape the exorcisms. Okay, so why is that? Is it just a matter of principle, uh, privacy concerns? or Privacy, absolutely. Yeah. Well, there have been audio tapes, and, and people could probably find them if they really look for them. And the trouble with the audio tapes, and sometimes, you know, languages have been recorded that appear to be, you know, impossible for the particular victim to have said because they don't know the, know the uh, language as another, another criteria of a true possession. And then even more bizarrely, going along with this whole difficulty, on the one hand, recognizing what, what the evidence base is, which is historical, 
But on the other hand, understanding that it's very hard to even tape these things. I have had people who taped exorcisms, you know, sort of Protestant friends of mine and stuff. And then they um, play back the tape and the tape is blank. Uh. And that's another power that sometimes these entities have. They have they have the ability to interfere with certain electronic communication. Have you found that too? When you tape people, when when you do a case and you evaluate someone, has anything no, happened like that? No, I personally never tape anybody. No. Okay. So, no. and and uh, does the church use you as part of the evidence. data cataloging? Say it again. Catalog. Does the does the church leverage you as part of the cataloging data to capture the scientific? You know, because you will evaluate and determine the mental state, the medical state. Is that part of the process that they use today well, to catalog for, these things? I don't work for the church, and I don't speak for the church. I am Catholic, yeah. and so as a Catholic professor of psychiatry, I also teach at a seminary, by the way. So, on the one hand, I'm pretty involved in a Catholic world. On the other hand, it's not like I uh, do these things for the church. First of all, I usually do them pro bono, and I render my opinion. And then, you know, people are free to decide whether they want to take my opinion or not. The, the, the Catholic Church in certain countries, it's not, it's not required to, but in certain countries, like the United States, which is cautious about this sort of thing, they normally will require a medical, especially a psychiatric practitioner to, you know, rule on a case to make sure that it's not mental illness or some other type of physical illness involved. And it's not like I'm, you know, working for anybody, you know, and these are not patients of mine, by the way. The cases I wrote about in my book, Demonic Foes, these are not patients of mine. These are people that, some of whom I came to know extremely well for instance, uh, a Satanist woman named Julia. I came to know her very well, but I came to know her not because she was a patient of mine. I didn't treat her. I don't treat these individuals. I keep a certain professional boundary there. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about your backstory. What brought you from your background growing up to the field of psychiatry? And if you could talk about the first day that Father Jake or Father Jock knocked on your door and introduced himself and how that kind of unfolded. Well, let me say more generally, Pretty much anything I've done in this field, I didn't really volunteer to do. I didn't volunteer to get involved with Father Jacques in the first place. He asked me to consult on a case. I became very involved with the International Association of Exorcists, which was founded in the in the early 1990s. And he asked me to become a member for a while. I was on the governing board as a kind of scientific advisor. In more recent years, a lot of people like yourself have asked me to appear on programs. You asked me, right? Mm -hmm. I did. I was writing you to be on a program. And then, you know, people asked me to write some articles like in the Washington Post to be interviewed on CNN, for instance. And also in more recent years, a lot of people wanted me to turn my um, experience into a book, which I did. And the book was completely accurate. I wasn't taking liberties, except that I, I made it clear that nobody's name or or Full identity could be could be uh, identified by the reader, which is standard for a you know, medical doctor talking about sensitive cases. So then you asked me about another set of issues. Well, on a more personal level, how did I, you know, agree to get involved in this? How did I? I mean, I was brought up Catholic, so I I, I think from a young age I did believe that probably uh, you know evil spirits existed based on the Gospels, and then. The Gospels, which were read in church, of course, all the time, talked about cases of possession. Now, I was skeptical enough, and I went through a period where, you know, like most young people, I questioned my faith. Is, is this really fullest revelation of God, so to speak? So I certainly went through periods where I said, well, maybe some of these cases of possessions were just mental illness. Maybe they were beliefs of the time that were mistaken. But especially as I was then asked to consult on some of these rare cases by Father Jacques, as you mentioned, uh, the first one, yeah, I began to see that there was a true reality behind these cases, that these were true supernatural or what we call preternatural, beyond nature phenomena, and that the best explanation was the traditional church's explanation that some people get possessed or attacked in other ways. 
Did you know Father Jack before he knocked on your door and asked you to become involved? Did he just appear? Or? I don't exactly know how he found me. I mean, I was, you know, a young academic psychiatrist at the time. I guess I knew enough priests who knew that I went to Mass and, and that sort of thing. So I was a practicing Catholic and because I had never met him before. Somehow he decided he would ask me to help out. And I remember saying, well, Father, I'm a little skeptical about some of this stuff. And, you know, I remember exactly what he said to me. He said, you're skeptical. That's exactly the type of person we want. What was that first case? I'm trying to remember. What was that first case that he brought to you? It was a uh, Hispanic American woman from out West whose name in the book I call Maria. Right. Yeah. He was not possessed. She would have spontaneous bruises appear all over her body. And she and her husband both claimed that she was getting literally beaten up by evil spirits. I observed the bruises and I made sure that she had a very clear medical evaluation. You know, bruises can come from different disorders. They can come from problems with blood clotting. So, you know, we had to check her platelets and I even got a hematologist involved to make sure she didn't have some rare bleeding disorder. There is something called psychogenic purpura, which means a type of bleeding, bruising-like phenomenon in the body, which stress contributes to. Once I had been able to rule out any possible medical disorder and followed her story that very credibly she appeared accurately to be describing getting getting beaten up by literally invisible spirits. I mean, she'd be lying in the bed and even her friends would be around and, and she would be acting like she was being assaulted by spirits that no one could see. She would tell people that that was her experience and her husband vouched for her. She was a wonderful woman. I did a psychiatric exam. She was completely sane. She was a basically a kind of happy, very devout woman, which is probably why she was targeted by the spirits because they, they sometimes don't like holy, very charitable people. She had claimed that she was cursed by somebody, which sounds kind of outlandish, but it might, might have had some truth to it too. And so what I concluded was to Father Jacques, I said, well, look, Father, there's no obvious medical or psychiatric explanation for this. And he said, yeah, that's exactly what I thought. He said, we don't call this a possession. We call this an oppression. Now, in the interim, I've seen many people who are attacked, scratched, choked. So I'm much more familiar at this point with what we call oppressions. And, And I think that was a genuine oppression. Could you define the difference between oppression and possession? It's essentially a matter of degree. Possessions are when a spirit or multiple spirit, but at least at least a spirit takes control of the body. They cannot get control of, you might say, the spirit or the soul. They can attack and control either parts of the body or even the consciousness. So they can affect the mental apparatus, the body, by invading it in some spiritual way. And that's a possession. Oppression is where they don't get full control of the individual, where they're attacking the person, sometimes in quite minor ways, but sometimes in more uh, serious ways, like with this woman, uh, Maria. Though they can also affect the senses and the imagination, so they can feed images and even messages to these people, then it behooves the doctor or psychiatrist to say, is this person just crazy or is this beyond a psychotic or suggestible, emotionally fragile individual who's just imagining things to the point where most likely explanation of either these internal or external attacks short of getting control of the individuals that we call oppression. So the uh, external ones are a little sensitive because if they're married or have a partner, it could be domestic abuse, which you have to kind of rule out as well. That could be kind of a tricky thing, correct? Absolutely. That's why you need a good history. 
And, you know, you do a standard history. And if you need to do medical tests, like I did with that woman, you do medical tests. You take, you take the evaluation as far as you know. I'll speak mostly for the Catholic Church, not that other churches aren't rigorous at times, too. But in, in the Catholic Church, the exorcist ultimately is supposed to have a kind of what they call moral certainty. It's almost like a legal term. It's like proven beyond reasonable doubt. They, they have to be quite certain in their mind that this is a true demonic attack as opposed to a mental illness. And the criteria for discerning that are very rigorous. For instance, you know, many people are aware that for a true possession, you not only have to have clear observational evidence that this spirit is somehow appearing or so controlling the person that they exhibit powers beyond human nature. What are those? And what are, these are the classic criteria uh, of possessions. In addition to the, the some appearance of some sort of a malevolent attack and entity, you're looking for things like, is this person all of a sudden speaking a foreign language that they never knew before? Meaning there's an intelligence possessing that individual that has that knowledge and intelligence. Number two, are they exhibiting such bizarre movements or strength that this is clearly beyond the human? And this is why it's called preternatural, beyond the natural. And finally, another very clear, important sign is, do these individuals know things that they would have no way of knowing otherwise? There's a Latin term, latra. Do they have hidden knowledge? So if they have this hidden knowledge, superhuman strength, bizarre movements, you know, like a levitation or something, uh, ability to speak a foreign language, which they do to kind of show off at times, you kind of have clear evidence that there's something that is beyond this human being's ability to come up with. And then if you have sort of strong observational evidence that this person is being attacked, let alone, you know, the revelation, which sometimes comes late, of the actual voice of a spirit coming out of this person, especially while the person is in a, in a trance. You need these kind of pieces of evidence, also some strong hostility to anything holy or religious then you begin to say, yes, there's no other explanation here. But it's a rigorous process. Today, we're doing this call via Zoom. But in your book, it's 25 years. And so a lot of these are, I'm assuming, are people going to your office, correct? I need them in my office if that's the most convenient thing to do. Again, they're not patients. They may, they may come to my office or I may go to meet them in a church or something where they're being interviewed also by other people in the, in the, in the church. It varies from time to time. Do you, like when you meet people, I know we're going to talk about Julia in a, in a little bit, are there cases where when they come in, just the hair in the back of your neck stands up and you're like, you just get a gut feeling before even starting it? I never go on gut feeling. Yeah. I remember early on, I was talking to a rather fundamentalist Christian and they said, well, Dr. Gallagher, once you do this for a while, you, you'll, you'll intuit whether the person has a spirit or not. And I, I know a few people who claim they do that and they're often wrong. This is a pretty rigorous, I would say, again, using this broader definition of science, this is not willy-nilly. This is a, a rigorous scientific, and, and, and it's a diagnostic process. I mean, there are certain, you know, diagnoses in medicine where you put the signs and symptoms together, and, you know, there may not be completely hard lab evidence or something, but that's how you make a diagnosis. It's very similar to what both exorcists and people like myself helping exorcists to discern sometimes do. We use definite criteria. And if you don't have those criteria, you just don't say, oh, well, I, I have this vague spiritual sense that this is a possession. You would not diagnose that person as possessed. Now, you mentioned people kind of come to you, and even the book you just wrote, Demonic Foes, people came to you and requested a book like this. Can you talk about the thought process and why you created it? Because you didn't do it like, you know, in the 80s or 90s. You, you waited for a while, so it wasn't like you were trying to capitalize 
Julia happened like in the 1990s or 1980s. So it wasn't like you were capitalizing on that story then. You, you're you doing it today in 2021. So what was the genesis of having you write this book and how did you structure it? Well, I waited a, a while to write it because I felt after, you know, 25 years or so, I just had a tremendous amount of experience that would be useful for me to share, not only to people, other people like myself in the field, and I'm not the only person in the field, but also either people who wanted to learn as lay people about this phenomena, and even even people who might suspect they have a problem of one sort or another, possession or oppression, and they, they wanted to get a uh, professional opinion about it. I am sure that I've seen more of these cases than any other physician in the world, perhaps any other physician in history. And as a professor of psychiatry, my former chairman, who was a very prominent psychiatrist, also a Catholic and former president of the American Psychiatric Association, he supported my work. And he said, you may have written a unique book in history because how many professors of psychiatry have had your involvement and how many people have your psychiatric expertise to write about this? The reason I saw so many cases is because, as you sort of said in the beginning, when I first got into this field, there weren't that many exorcists. So I worked especially with these two prominent guys I mentioned in the book using pseudonyms, Father A and Father Jacques. And they would go all around the country, and sometimes I would accompany them. And of course, because I've been a member of the International Association, I've heard about cases all over the world, and I've, I've gotten, in the intervening years, calls from all over the world. So I have a very unusually high level of experience with many, many cases for all those reasons, including the fact that even an exorcist is usually, if you know anything about the organization of the Catholic Church, it's organized by what they call dioceses. And the bishop in the diocese is kind of the the Lord and King. He's the one who decides, well, okay, I'm going to authorize an exorcism or not, although he may designate that decision. But he's responsible for a a small region. No individual exorcist confined to a diocese, which is now often the case. I mean, they're just not going to see that many cases during the course of their lifetime. I was seeing cases, including with these two prominent American exorcists, when there were very few all over the country. Let's talk about Julia. She had seen two psychiatrists before you seeing her. Why did she need to see a third psychiatrist? And how did that first meeting with her go? As I recall a little more precisely, I'm not sure that this is clear in the book. She had seen two psychologists and she had seen a priest psychiatrist. And the two psychologists... I mean, I won't go into too much detail. The two psychologists felt this was clearly beyond any kind of psychiatric problem. The other psychiatrist wanted to observe her in a hospital, and she said, you know, I'm not crazy. I'm not going into any darn hospital. Uh, I don't think she was the word darn. And the priest, who was this priest exorcist, prominent guy I call Father Jacques, he wanted to see me not because he was unclear at that point, I mean, you know, her symptoms, if you want to use that word, were so remarkable. He was, he was sure that she was possessed. Yeah, but she he, was possessed, not oppressed. So she was a, a, one of the rare cases of her possession, correct? Yeah, and this was an incredibly flamboyant case, which I can elaborate on if you want. But he wanted her to talk to me. And again, she's not my patient. And I told her, I said, look, Julia, not her real name. I said, you know, if you need a psychiatrist, you need medications to relax you, you want to talk to a therapist, I'll help arrange that. But I'm, I'm not the person. I'm being a consultant for Father Jacques, and you can talk to me or not. And I said, what he really wants me to talk to you about is your whole ambivalence about getting help. She was ambivalent about getting help because she had a lot of psychic powers, which she didn't want to give up. And she got it, in her opinion, from Satan. The price was that she was possessed. She didn't want to be possessed. She wanted to have her cake and eat it too. Yeah, she did some, uh, not to tell too much, but she did some pretty horrible things regarding orgies and fetuses and things. 
but she didn't really want to have remorse for that. She just didn't want to be possessed for the most part. So her like forgiveness wasn't probably the true forgiveness in a Catholic sense that you look for in cases like this, correct? It's quite clear unless she gave up her evil lifestyle and unless she stopped worshiping Satan, which she did, and unless she um, left the cult, yeah, she would never get better. And, and she wouldn't be able to utilize exorcisms, which were sort of being attempted willy-nilly. So if you think about it, Bob, this was an incredibly remarkable case. Here you had, number one, a rare Satanist. I'm not the type of person who says Satanists are hanging out at every corner neighborhood. Number two, she was willing to reveal the inner workings of the cult to me. And I came to know her and her history extremely well because the priest wanted me to talk to her about her ambivalence and lack of motivation, let's call it. And number three, it turned out to be what these two exorcists themselves, these incredibly experienced guys, said was the most flamboyant possession they had ever seen. Now, what did they mean by that? Again, and I did not, I, I have been to several hundred exorcisms in my life over, remember, 25 years. Yeah. On the other hand, I could not go to hers. Had a family. I was a practicing psychiatrist. I was an academic psychiatrist, publishing things and stuff. So I really didn't have the time to go to her exorcisms. On the other hand, the people who attended the exorcism, including these two priests and about seven other people, they all told me the most remarkable stories. They all witnessed her levitating. They all witnessed her speaking in the voice of the, the spirit, uh, many different languages. She herself was remarkable that even outside of her trance possession states, she knew all kinds of things. She told me, for instance, how my mother had died you know, years earlier of ovarian cancer, but she did that with many, many people, about many, many people. She claimed that she could see people from a distance. Now, if you know anything about, you know, the sort of pseudoscientific field, which is what I regarded as a parapsychology, they study these phenomena, they, they, they often, you know, have no good explanation. Because Actually, do you mind if I interject one thing? When we're talking the 1980s. So when she's sharing information, she's not going on Google and looking things up because that was didn't exist at that point. So she's she's finding stuff that she could certainly not find anywhere. Correct. On that, it, it's it's that she had knowledge that was obviously, you know, the skeptical say, well, she was a good guesser. She did hold readings, this sort of. Yeah. Stuff. yeah. And, you know, I suppose there are some people who are very good at that. The kind of detail that she knew was so precise about so many people. I mean, unless she had a team of 10 private investigators, you know, accompanying her. And she had no, no reason for doing that. And she said, look, I have this ability because Satan gave me this ability. But here's a good example of something that is even more remarkable, but in line with this knowing hidden things, hidden knowledge. She claimed to me that she could see people at a distance. So I remember saying to her one day after she said to me, well, I can see Father A from a distance right now. And Father A was about 100 miles away. I said, really? I said, you haven't talked to him? No, I haven't talked to him in weeks. I said, okay, Miss Smarty Pants, prove it to me. I said, I'm going to call him after you tell me what he's doing right now. She goes, well, he's walking along a beach. He's saying his prayers. I said, what is he wearing? He has a um, windbreaker on, what color, blue. And I said, anything else? Yeah, he's wearing his khakis. So I said, okay, I'm going to call him. So I call him. I say, Father A, this is Rich Gallagher. I said, what are you doing? He said, he said uh, well, who wants to know? I say, I say, I want to know. I didn't want to tell him yet. So he goes, well, you know, usually I would be saying my breviary, which are the prayers, at where I live, you know, my residence. But I decided I'd take a little drive. I'd go to the shore. I'd walk along the beach. And I said, uh, and what are you wearing? He said, um, 
Well, you know, I, I used to be in the military. I had my khaki pants. I said, what about a uh, jacket and tie? He said, no, it's cool. So I had my, my windbreaker in. I said, what color? And then he said to me, I remember him saying to me, I, I know what's going on. He says, you're talking to Julia, right? I said, yeah. He said, yeah, she's something else, huh, Rich? <laughs> okay. There were scores of these things, scores of these things. I don't mean, you know, this particular remote knowledge, but this hidden knowledge. She spoke languages during the exorcisms. She levitated. You know, I mean, you believe it or not. I mean, I believe it because I talked to, I some of it observed myself and some of it, eight or nine people told me, salt of the earth people. Her story was completely credible. She was possessed because she was a worshiper of Satan. I don't think there's a lot of those people, but there are some of those people. So she was never, we don't want to take everything from the book, but she was never quite cured despite all the exorcisms. Do you think the demon inside her was actually Satan or was it another powerful demon? Did they ever get even close to identifying that? They lied. So you, you never quite know until they're really forced eventually to acknowledge who they are. Yeah, so I don't know. I think I, the, demon, the demon during the exorcisms talked about some name and maybe there was more than one. You know, a lot of this stuff is a little murky because you can't, you can't believe these demons. It never got to the point where we were confident that the demons were speaking truthfully because she refused to continue. Look, she was scared of the cult. She was afraid they were going to harm her. Number two, she didn't want to give up her powers, which she would. She was, she was right that she had these psychic abilities that she would lose these abilities if she was uh, delivered because she got them from the demonic world. I, I, I believe that she got it directly from Satan because she prayed to Satan. And number three, she was sort of in love with the leader of the cult who was a truly nefarious evil man. And... Uh, like these women who love criminals or something. I mean, somehow she was uh, entranced by this guy and um, she knew that he would be extremely upset if she turned to the church, so to speak. So she called me one day and, uh, well, we spoke and she said, I can't continue. About a year and a half later, she called me. She said, well, I changed my mind. I want my ex the exorcism again. And I said to her, this was on the phone, I said, well, look, Julia, you know, first of all, you have to commit to it. And second of all, why do you want to do it now? She said, well, I'm dying of cancer. And I said, well, I need to speak to your oncologist. And she goes, yeah, I'll think about whether I want you to talk to him. What was her motive? I don't know. But then, then, then we never heard from her again. And we think she died because I think she, we definitely would have heard from her if she was still alive. Although it's possible. It's possible she's alive. I mean, I kind of hope that. Uh, but I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe her cancer was cured. So the last story about Julia was actually the first one where you met her. I've heard it on a couple different podcasts. I just think, you know, so I know it's been mentioned before about the cats. You mind just talking about that? And then I want to talk about a couple other cases. Well, my wife and I, I mean, I'm in this house right now and uh, upstairs right above me is our bedroom. We were in our bedroom. We had two cats at the time and about three o'clock in the morning, we were awakened by these two cats going at each other like prize fighters, really trying to destroy each other. And we'd never seen that before. And as a matter of fact, they're not alive now, but you know, we never, we never saw that again. And so my wife and I looked at each other, we had to separate them. Did they get a hold of catnip? Who knows? And, you know, we went back to bed. Surprisingly to me, because this was something also that has never happened since and will not happen again. The priest brought this woman to meet me to my house. <sighs> and the first thing that came out of her mouth when we got introduced was, oh, hi, Dr. Gallagher. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, by the way, how did you like those cats last night? Oh, boy. Oh. You know, I was just as flabbergasted and as much by the assertion as by her cavalier attitude about it, you know? And I remember blurting out something like, look, lady, I don't know you, you ever do that again. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna help you in any way. She never really apologized. And I came to know her better and, you know, you meet somebody and 
I suppose it's like meeting a, a charming criminal. You, you kind of develop a certain liking for them despite her evil ways. And, uh, you know, she genuinely felt I was helping her and genuinely felt that uh, I was a nice guy. She said she would never lie to me. So, you know, I worked with her for a while, but I, I was never really able to convince her this is the way to go, Julian. So if there was like a opposite case of hers, it'd be about a gentleman named Juan, I think that was in your book. So Julia is a case of where she came, she was possessed, but she was not ever going to be free from an exorcism because she wasn't in it to win it. Can you just give us the broad strokes about Juan, his story? Well, Juan, Juan was a criminal. You know, I'm not exactly sure where in the hierarchy of gangsterdom he was, but he had worked his way up as a drug dealer and a, and a pretty violent guy to the point where, you know, he was very ambitious. And somebody said that he wanted to be wealthy and, uh, as you said, have all the girls and cars he ever wanted as a poor kid growing up. And uh, he said, well, you know, he said, I had some fellow gangsters who exposed me to some uh, Mexican devil cults. I mean, it wasn't MS-13, but it was something, you know, sort of similar. He said, they, they said, if I turn to evil spirits, they'll help me. He said, all of a sudden, I, I, I had so much great luck. I was king of the heap. I was making tons of money until I wasn't, which is when he got arrested. Then he went to prison. There was a, a prison chaplain who diagnosed the possession, um, did some exorcisms while he was in prison, he never really committed himself that well to it. And so when he was released from prison, as he was eventually, yeah, he had serious charges, but he denied that he ever murdered anybody. He certainly beat people up. And he came to, again, one of the churches, not, not my own diocese. And he said, you know, look, I, I was told in prison that possessed and I feel I'm still possessed and I finally learned my lesson that I got to get rid of this by returning to the church. I baptized a Catholic as a kid, but I've never really practiced my religion. Now, his wife, for instance, told me that she was somewhat educated and she said, you know, well, sometimes he speaks what I think is Latin. I've seen him levitate from his bed. This is the real deal. I evaluated him. I agreed that he was possessed. And he then turned to the church, became a fairly uh, pleasant, devout person, which is part of the process. It's not like you just magic prayers of the exorcism. You have to turn to God. And uh, he eventually had a series of exorcisms, some of which I attended, and he eventually got better. If there's a formula for an exorcism or someone to be oppressed or possessed, it seems to be somewhere in their life, in their back life, they either went away from the church or they dabbled in the occult. Then fast forward a couple of years, they decided to go on the right track. And once they went to the church, that almost kind of ignited the demons to act up within them because they were almost yeah, revolting. I mean, I think you've summarized well the preponderance of people who get serious possessions. Presence a little bit differently. There's, they're, they're more diverse in their symptomatology, and they're also a little more diverse in their causes. But I think you've nailed pretty well the part about possessions, other than it may be that these individuals, for instance, Juan, he was possessed. He wasn't fully committed to giving up his ways. Until he was, he was probably still possessed that whole time without seeking help. And then it is true when the individual turns to getting help and or, and the two have to go together, attempts to reform their life, at least overtly, the demons may, may seem to be stepping up their attack. Yeah, they don't like, I mean, their whole aim is to prevent that. So they don't like when somebody turns to, to our Lord, uh, when somebody tries to develop a, a, a genuine spiritual life, and when they turn to the church for help. All these things go together, or else you don't get delivered. So there is a way in which when people go through that, the demons will become, you might say, more overt or more obvious in their attack. That's true. 
the last one I'm going to mention from the book is if, if you'd mentioned there could potentially be a movie based on your experiences, I think one of the great scenes would be, I don't remember the person's name, but it was a woman who, whenever anything was mentioned about religion or blessings or prayer, it just, she didn't hear it. Auditory, it was like a blank, like she never heard it. There's this creepy scene where you wrote something down on paper. And that's kind of normal, I guess. You mentioned, I don't know if it's with oppressed as well as possessed, but it actually is painful to go to the church or, or to be involved in, in you know, religious sacraments and things like that. So do you mind just at a high level sharing that story? Because that was one of the ones that really kind of creeped me out. I was a woman who was a housewife, and I, I call her, uh, you know, changing her residence. I, I you know, name a, I took a state at random and put her there and called her Catherine again, not her real name. So she was also possessed, and she had also had some sketchy practices of occultism as a younger girl with some of her friends. She was convinced that was why she became uh, possessed. But all these cases are a little bit different. I mentioned that in oppressions, demons can physically attack people, but they can also attack people's senses and their mental functioning. Well, with her, they affected her senses, and it progressed to a full possession. So obviously, those, all those sort of things that happen with oppression, since a possession is a more intensified attack, all those things can happen in the context of a possession. The way it was in, I was introduced to her, uh, this was again was Father Jacques with a, a local priest where she lived. And uh, they said, well, Rich, um, we can't talk to her about religious stuff because she can't hear it, can't hear us saying anything. And I tested this out. For instance, I said, Catherine, you know, did you go to the store this morning? Yeah, I bought some bread. Uh, where else did you go? I went to the gas station. Catherine, did you pray today? Did I what? Catherine, when's the last time you've been to church? What? When I've been where? So the demons were blocking her hearing. So I had, an, I had a psychiatrist friend at the time who, you know, uh, I would talk about this stuff with, and he accompanied with, and we came up with this plan. Well, okay, why don't we write down the questions? So we took a piece of paper. Catherine, what are, you, what are you cooking today, you know? And she would say to us, I'm cooking corned beef and cabbage. I'm baking a pie. She was a good cook. Then we wrote on this piece of paper, Catherine, are you trying to pray and trust in God? And she looked at us with disappointment and said, Dr. Gallagher, what, why are you messing with me? And I said, what do you mean? She said, the, the 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 piece of paper you're showing me is blank. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Wow. It was, interfere, it was able to interfere, which, which I hadn't known. I'm not sure anybody else knew prior to that. The demons could interfere with their hearing. You know, they weren't going to let us win the battle. Yeah. You know, we wrote it down in questions. We were trying to outsmart them. Well, they would make sure that she couldn't see things. Yeah, that was a fantastic story. There's a guy named Father Vincent Lampert. He's a... Uh, He's a fairly well-known Catholic priest. He's an exorcist. And yeah. he actually became an exorcist when the guy that did it died. So the bishop said, you're it. He was asked about how he became an exorcist. And he half-jokingly replied, wrong place, wrong time. It's probably uh, instilled, made your faith even stronger, but it's also been quite a journey. So is that kind of true for you too? Or how would you, you describe? I've met him over in Italy at the international meetings. He's a wonderful guy good sense of humor, and that reflects his sense of humor, you know? I mean, look, uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but I was in a place that circumstance led Father Jacques to knock on my door. I guess because pretty much everything I've done, Bob, has been because people have asked me. I guess I feel, you know, this wasn't some grand ambition of mine. This wasn't some uh, rushing where angels fear to tread. So I guess I see it more as a providential thing. Like anybody's 
mission in life, taking care of a family, running a podcast, you know, whatever people feel their mission in life is, I, I guess feel this was sort of assigned to me. So I do the best I can to do a good job about it. I don't really think was I lucky or unlucky. And has this really sealed the deal for your faith? I mean, look, you've you've seen kind of what the devil is like in such a degree that most people don't over the past of the you know the past 25, 30 years. Has this been something that's really solidified your belief system? You know, even though you are a man of science as well as history and, and faith, which are, sometimes would, they're at odds. I would say yes. Now remember, I, I I would say Father Jacques wouldn't have come to me in the first place unless he thought probably I was a practicing Catholic, but you know. We all have our moments of doubts. We all have our questions. This is definitely, it's a good word to use, solidified a kind of deeper faith on my part. I mean, I, I feel that some of the things written about in the Gospels, evil spirits, possession, and our Lord's power, you know, tremendous power over this realm, even though God allows some terrible things, you know, he allows poverty, cancer, and it's really up to humans to try to rectify these problems. There's a lot of crap in the world, and, you know, he allows it for his strange purposes. This is one other thing that he allows for his strange purposes, but we trust that in the uh, eyes of eternity, we'll see some mysterious providential purpose in all this. If a person is feeling like they are being oppressed, so look, I, I guess if you're being oppressed, you're more likely to know that something's kind of funky. If you're possessed, you've already kind of succumbed to the demon or whatever, and they have control of you. But if a person's feeling like something's a bit odd, and they're going to feel kind of weird about it, what would you recommend that they do? They feel like they're being physically attacked, or somehow their mental apparatus is being manipulated. They get a consultation from a religious clergy person that they respect. If that person, you know, says, well, either here's what I think, or I'm not sure, you know, they take the person's advice to get a consultation from a medical doctor, hopefully a medical doctor that has an open mind. And then, you know, they, they go through this, this process and then try to elicit good advice from, from people. Not everybody who's oppressed needs an exorcism. You know, they may just need strong spiritual advice and uh, an intensification of their prayer life. So go to their local diocese. Is there like a website? There are a lot of websites that talk about this stuff, some more professional than others or more astute than others. But the, the basic idea is they would go to their local clergy person. Uh, that person would probably refer them to the diocesan office if they thought this was warranted. They have to be open in humility to say, well, you know, could I have a mental illness? feel they're hearing spirits, but we think it's a brain disorder. So at some point, they have to have the humility to open themselves up to the idea that they may be mistaken. And there are a lot of people who feel they're attacked by evil spirits who, in my opinion, are not. And lastly, your book, and, and to follow you, because you're on a lot of podcasts, most recently, too, you're popping up a lot with your book, Demonic Foes. Where can people go to follow you and your book and what you're doing? I'm, I'm sure it's in a lot of bookstores, but, you know, a lot of people find it easiest, at least, to look up the book on Amazon or the HarperCollins website. Long and short of it, they can get the book very easily on a site like Amazon.com. Is it okay to tease that there may be a movie coming out about this? And when would they be, you know, when, when should they, would they have rumors of that? Well, uh, again, with a little bit of hesitation, because you're then dealing with Hollywood and corporate America, you know, I did uh, agree to have a film made of the movie. Have you heard of the name Jason Blum? Yes. Yeah, well, he's a pretty prominent yep. uh, ghost house. Big shot now. Yeah, ghost house. Pretty, yep. Normal activity. Also, Black Klansman and uh, Whiplash. I mean, he's made some very, very good movies. And he uh, said, Rich, this is about the best story I've ever heard for a movie. And so, uh, you know, we, we assigned them, assigned them the, the rights and they're going to make a movie. You know, these things take time, so it probably won't be out for a couple of years. It'll probably, yeah. probably center on the story of Julia. Yeah, I was thinking like, because Conjuring franchise, I could see a whole bunch of sub stories coming out of this for that. If they did make a movie, who do you think if they cast you, who do you think would be someone good? And for Julia and for Father Jack? I'd have to think about all this. I mean, I think of Father Jacques. It's a guy like a guy Wilkerson in the uh, the Tom Emily Wilkerson. 
If you saw the movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, he yep. was a priest in the movie. Okay. Julia, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. Originally, people said it should be uh, Angelina Jolie. Uh, other people have said maybe Jennifer Lawrence. I mean, I'm not adverse to uh, Brad Pitt playing me. <laughs> <laughs> but is he a good basketball player? Because, look, you played basketball when you were younger. You call me a basketball player. I was a big fish in a little pond. Trust me. Yeah. Just a background for everybody is you, before you entered the field of psychiatry, I believe you were overseas in France with your brother and you taught and you played basketball overseas in France, correct? Yes. And who, who scored more points? So the last question, who had the higher average, you or your brother? Well, uh, I did. <laughs> so it wasn't because I was better than him. It's because I played in a lesser league. Okay. Very, very diplomatic. <laughs> I have three brothers, and we all play basketball. And I do uh, let it be known that I had the high, the highest scoring game. I scored fifty-eight points in one game. All right. And they are very quick to remind me. Well, consider the competition, Rich. Did you have like a Heinsohn hook, or did you have like a bank shot, or what was your signature uh, shot? That was a pretty good shooter. Love that. I'm a Boston Celtics guy. Did we miss anything? Again, I just want to stress maybe one final point. I am a psychiatrist. Uh, you know, I don't reveal people's identity. There have even been people who have said to me, you know, Dr. Gallagher, you've helped me and I'd like to appear on a radio show or something. And I say, you can do that. I don't participate in that. In other words, I'd never ask anybody to do that. I value, of course, people's privacy and confidentiality. That's a great way to end. I want to thank you very much for your time today, Dr. Gallagher. It's been very informative. And uh, you're one of the guys I was really looking forward to interviewing. So thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. And you obviously did your homework, Bob. Okay. I love the book. Great job. I highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You've been listening to the Afraid of Nothing podcast. Please subscribe and like us on Facebook. Until next time. Stay scared. Hey, you're still here? Great. Then why not listen to another episode? Visit afraidofnothingpodcast.com to peruse all the shows. That's afraidofnothingpodcast.com. And while you're there, click the coffee cup icon to buy me a coffee and leave a review. I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming episode, and the world will know how swell you are.